Please be seated. Distinguished guests, distinguished colleagues, dear all. My name is Henk Kummeling, and as Rector Magnificus of this magnificent university, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this special academic ceremony. And how great it is that you all made it despite the appalling weather. Thank you very much for putting all the effort in. This afternoon, Professor Fatima Denton will deliver her inaugural address, titled Power and Powerlessness in Climate Diplomacy, Looking Beyond the Surface for a Just Transition. Professor Denton has been appointed as holder of the, of the Prince Klaus Chair 2020-2024. Uh, uh, she is currently the director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, in Accra. Ghana, which she joined in 2018. And before this, Dr. Denton worked with the United Nations Economic Commission in, for, for Africa and Ethiopia from 2012, where she coordinated the African Climate Policy Center and was director, special initiatives division, uh, division. In her work, she has straddled research and policy. And recently, she was a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on the Climate Change Special Report on Climate Change and Land. She holds a PhD in public si political science from Birmingham University. Professor Denton's research has centered on climate change adaptation with a focus on resilient systems in sectors such as agriculture, water, energy, principally in Africa. Her work has explored the intersections between adaptation and mitigation, gender and development, and energy poverty and development. Since 2012, she has specialized in green industrialization, decarbonization strategies, and renewable energy transformations in Africa. Her career so far has been rich and diverse. And now she has found the way to us in her new capacity as holder of the Prince Klaus Chair in Development and Equity, a chair established by Utrecht University and the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and a chair that rotates between the two institutions. And now we are the lucky one. And we are very pleased indeed to have Professor Denton with us. Utrecht University welcomes the opportunity to leverage the PCC to build a durable strategic alliance with collaborating institutions in the Global South around the theme of just transitions. As the search committee pointed out, a key issue for Professor Denton is bringing scholars from the Global South together with scholars from the North. She wants greater visibility for Southern scholars and she also considers the PCC chair as an opportunity to build and strengthen the academic profile of her work and that of her colleagues, and explicitly ask the search committee for opportunities to collaborate on academic publications. Overall, the curatorium of the Prince Klaus chair was very impressed by the achievements and the plans of Dr. Denton her ambition to engage with the student population and to bring together conceptual and policy work on just transitions, and they are extremely valuable to us. And I'm almost convinced, almost sure, that the collaboration will not to be to the detriment of Professor Denton either. After the deliverance of the inaugural address, you will have the opportunity to congratulate Professor Denton and the reception will take place in the Senate Hall and the cortege of professors will be guiding you to the right place. And now I gladly give the floor to Professor Denton. Thank you. I just have to make sure that my timer is on because <laughs> I do have this tendency to go on for a bit longer, so I wanted to make sure that I've got my timer on. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Hank. Um, good afternoon. 
I should start off by saying. Um, Professor Rector uh, Magnificus, um, former rectors, um, Professor Bert Kunders, um, the chair of the curatorium, um, professors and members of the Prince Klaus um, curatorium, deans, vice deans, ladies and gentlemen. This day has come, I have to say to myself first. <laughs> um, it's been quite a while thinking about um, this, um, thinking about this, um, this inaugural lecture. I had the pleasure to attend um, the previous um, Prince Klaus um, chair, Hayat, and I saw just how formal it is and I'm not quite used to formal settings like this. Um, but um, I am hoping that I will be able to live up to the, the expectations of a formal setting. So it gives me great pleasure um, to stand here before you and to discuss the subject of power and just transitions. Um, I would like to first of all start off by saying that power permeates the entire climate diplomacy. Um, power is featured also in the entire system from historical emissions to the policy instruments to the gov governance system. Um, so in that sense, I think this is a very appropriate theme First, to help us navigate, um, not just about the power labyrinth, but also to really understand what char characterizes climate diplomacy. Um, to understand how we manage the multiple storms, especially in this era that we live in, this multiple crisis, this polycrisis as we call it. Um, and basically to be able to, to, to understand the implications on just transitions. Um, I'd like to start off by, by citing Lawrence and uh, Laybon um, in their book, Planet on Fire, when they say it's all about power, power, and power. Um, and that to me is um, exactly what the, the diplomacy um, related to climate has been. So in climate diplomacy, um, the narrative is an essential medium of influence for telling one's story how we convey the story, from whose point of view, how facts can be manipulated sometimes, how they can be framed um, to tell one set of issues or to portray one set of issues. Um, this is all part of the power game and it's all associated with climate diplomacy. We see incomplete or sometimes overtly false narratives that are frequently motivated, I'd say, to a large extent by political agendas. And this can sometimes decide to choose one version of the story that they want to tell. They can understate the problem and they can fail to recognize the major, the major issues related to climate catastrophe. Um, and I think this is why it's interesting when Chinua Chebi was citing an African proverb and he said, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And here he was extolling the virtue of the narrative, the importance of a narrative, the narrative um, as a multiplier in relating a story. And when Achebe mused in an interview, he said, um, relating to the power of the narrative, and the, the whole story around glorifying the hunter. He says, once I realized that, I had to be a writer. I had to be a historian. It's not one man's job. It's not one person's job. But it's something we have to do so that the story of the hunt will always reflect the agony, the travail, the bravery even of the lions. So in this sense, I think, um, as I mentioned, narratives are essential. Um, one of the most unifying challenges of the 21st century is climate change. It transcends cultures, locations, and individuals. When we tell the story from the perspective of an emaciated polar bear, when we tell the story from the faces of drought and farming in the Horn of Africa, when we tell the story from the devastating floods in Pakistan, or the significant ice retreat that we're witnessing in the Antar Antarctica, 
The narrative and the agent behind the story are essential components of the framing. If the story is conveyed without context, its value is diminished and its potency is lost. Hence, the fight for our shared home is also the fight to create spaces for marginalized voices to be heard and for fostering an inclusive process that celebrates diversity. As I contemplated the lecture, I rummaged through my personal memories of growing up in the Gambia and my mental landscape of power. I recall one of my most powerful manifestations of opposing forces. I returned from school one afternoon and I went directly to my grandmother's house. She was the matriarch and she kept us all on our toes. But she was also a wellspring of love. And when we were hurt or wounded, we turned to her. Crying bitterly, I attempted to recount what has happened. And after several attempts explaining what was wrong, I finally told her about an incident of being bullied by a classmate with a slap that rung in my ears for a very long time. The classmate was not only bigger than I, um, but he also came with a strong political pedigree. His father was revered and respected. He was one of the founding fathers of the Gambian independence. So my grandmother slipped on her shoes, grabbed my hand, and hurriedly left the house in the direction of this lad's house, whose father was a minister and at the time was busy with one of his surgeries where people come and they tell you all about their problems. When we arrived at the minister's residence, we were greeted by gatekeepers who signaled to my grandmother to wait her turn. No, she yelled, I'm not here to wait in queue. I need to speak with the minister, so please move out of my way. She was only four feet tall and fearless. The guard hurried in and basically had to do what my grandmother said because he realized that my grandmother wasn't going to budge. The minister came out looking quite perplexed and not quite understanding what it is that, ha that he had done to merit the wrath of this woman. My grandmother decided to shorten the long traditional salutations with a very short good afternoon. I'm here to tell you that your son has decided to hit my granddaughter yet again. Now I want to tell you that this is the last time that he will do this. And if this occurs again, I will personally discipline him in a manner that you will not recognize him when I'm done. The minister offered a regal smile. His voice was soft. And when he spoke, he spoke as somebody who has had long experience of hearing such voices. And he said to my grandmother, I've heard you and I will ensure that my son never bullies your granddaughter again. He made a few complimentary remarks and invited my grandmother to stay for lunch. She politely declined and exited the building, passing through even more people than when we came in. My grandmother's story is intriguing because to a large extent it parallels Max's idea regarding relationship between power, class, and the formation of ideology. Although Max's perspective was deeply rooted in his own critique of capitalism and its associated inequalities, my grandmother recognized the bully as a member of a political elite who through patronage, social class, and economic power controlled and maintained a particular social order. My classmate and I were only nine years old and we are far too young to grasp the complexities of Marxian theory. But it was my first induction, or rather I should say my first introduction to class, to power, and social order. I'd like to pivot back to power and do a very quick tour of what, is forensic, what are the forensics of power, and ask the following questions. What is power? Where is power resident? And I'm almost forgetting that I have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Where is power resident? These questions, I think, would help us understand how power is used to produce, 
to reproduce a set of scenarios and outcomes. I would like to lean on a few voices, uh, voices of social theorists, of philosophers from Max to Foucault, to understand power and to understand its reach. And through this lecture, I will crisscross the political, economic, social, legal, and institutional paradigms that would enable power, uh, that enables power to prevail. And I will draw on some examples, examples of how power affects justice and trace the genealogy of injustice, especially in the negotiation process. I would, also like, I would also like to show how current governance and systems are anchored in a winner-takes-all approach. If climate change is about our shared humanity, how do we rid ourselves of this winner-take-all mentality? And I argue that climate diplomacy is about using soft power, using soft power to influence an outcome that will bring us much closer to the 1.5 degrees and perhaps enable a low carbon development. And how we real trust back into the debates, I think is going to be fundamentally important um, in ensuring that um, power um, is used as a force for good. The concept of power is as fundamental to social science as energy is to physics. And this is what um, Bertrand Russell says. And in many ways, Max believed that power obscures truth. According to him, power places an excessive amount of control over those who are ruled and those who are in the hands of the sovereign. There are deteriorating indicators of climate change um, related to power. Let's take land degradation um, as an example, and I wanted to talk to this slide. Um, in particular, deforestation. Um, considering the fact that um, forests are very important, forests are an important source, um, as you know, for um, carbon sequestration, for sequestering carbon. Um, and in Africa, deforestation is not just an um, a function or a problem related to climate change. In Africa, deforestation is also a structural problem. But at the same time, it's important to note that people use deforestation as a survival mechanism. Um, and it's survival for the powerful as well as the powerlessness. Um, the, the, when you talk about the degradation of soils, um, this has obvious repercussions for smallholder farmers and their food systems. And many of them are reliant on fertilizers, on agricultural techniques, because um, extreme damage can also cause tipping points. So the, the, the primary culprits are deforestation, the conversion of land to agriculture, the wildfires, and human settlement. These are the issues related to um, deforestation. But at the same time, it's important to note that when you take the Congo River Basin, the Congo Basin, for instance, um, it has been re renamed, if you like, the lungs of the planet as a result of its nearly 152 million hectares of forest, which is five times the size of France. And more than four million acres of forest are lost annually in Africa, which is double the global average. Six of the ten countries with the largest annual net loss of forest, of forest cover are located in Africa. And some, of, some regions on the continent lose more than 50 tons of soil per hectare per year due to the loss of forest cover, which is an enormous loss. So if we are able to preserve the forest canopy, we will have enormous potential for carbon sequestration. But all the same, this is one area where we see um, the symbols of power. I want to talk about some of the things that we see or we think about when we, when we, think, when we talk about power. Um, just basically to say the history of environmental degradation allows us to identify dependencies 
and it allows us to also identify unequal breakdown. We talk very often about the tragedy of the commons, the notion of unrestricted access of environmental public goods, where our social and our economic progress are reached at the expense of an environment that is still relevant to our common narrative. The environment becomes the casualty. And indeed, there is a very strong link between societal progress and environmental breakdown. The one is destroyed and the other is preserved. And again, as Martin Lawrence mentioned in The Planet of Fire, that he argues that many countries have not found the balance between social progress and environmental preservation. Hence, the, na the, the notion of a developed nation does not exist as few countries have managed to provide a decent life to its people without destroying the preconditions upon which society depends. We all live in developing nations, he argues. And again, according to Marx, economic structures and the ownership of the means of production are the source of power. And through expropriation of the means of production, the bourgeoisie service serves as a governing class and they wield authority and power. Labor is used to extract power from the populace and as a mechanism for dominance and control. Power is manifested through struggles between classes, unequal wealth distribution, social relations that tend to perpetuate the capitalist exploitation. Max defines power as the probability that one actor within a social relationship will be in a position to carry out his own will despite resistance, regardless of the basis on which the probability rests. Let's look at Weber. According to him, power is multifarious. It exists not just in resource ownership and control of economic forces, but also in one's ability to influence others. For Weber, Power feeds on the legitimacy of the authority and it's based on individuals' consent and trust in the legitimacy of those in power. The exercise of authority and hierarchical structures as well as formal and bureaucratic institutions make power even more inherent. I want to move a little bit um, to talk about Foucault and his own thinking and, and, and theorization, I'd say, of power. I would say for Foucault, power is tolerable only on condition that it marks a substantial part of itself. In Foucault's functional analysis of power relations, the dilemma of legitimacy is rejected. Foucault, for instance, replaces Web Weber's notion of an legitimate order with the study of how power operates and the analytics, the, the, the analytics of power. And Foucault's model of power as a dispositif enables an analysis of polymorphous techniques of subjugation without the interference of concern about the legal normative justification. Is, power, is the power domain distinct from the production domain? Is politics and power solely determined by economic and production relations? According to Marx, as I said before, the problem of power and democracy will resolve each other with the socialization of property, the means of production, and the means of property. But for Foucault, cognitive relations are the birthplace of power. Knowledge and power are substitutes. Pouvoir, savoir. Power subordinates knowledge. It makes it serve as its own. Knowledge has attributes, communication, recording, accumulation, displacement, all of which are associated with power. The relationship between knowledge and power is one of subordination and superimposition. Power and knowledge are inextric inextricably linked, intertwined. Neither can exist without the other. Power and knowledge relations function independently of the operation of the other. Power and knowledge are entangled in a knot without entanglement. There is no power without knowledge. 
and there is no knowledge without power. No outside, no priority. So in many ways, knowledge and power are interchangeable. They are interrelated. And this would presuppose that when developed countries decide to invest in a novel energy source, for instance, they're already aware of the potential returns. If you take the example of um, Namibia, for instance, that is looking to invest in hydrogen um, and the deployment of hydrogen, Namibia, first of all, has to think about how to put um, the infrastructure together. Namibia has to think about the resources that it needs. Namibia has to think about the trajectory um, of this infrastructure and what will happen. The knowledge related to the deployment of hydrocarbon is not something that might be contained within Namibia. And so many of the multinational um, companies have already got a head start. They've already got a head start of what hydrogen investment would look like. And very often, the contracts they sign with countries like Namibia is indicative of the power that they already have. And therein lies the problem. So where is power resident? I want to argue that historical emissions of how power is emitted, um, to how it's produced, to how it's consumed, um, is in itself, to a large extent, the, the birthplace of power. When you talk about the financial architecture, when you talk about the enigmatic $100 billion that has been promised to developing countries, when you look across issues around technology transfer um, that is forever coming, when you think in terms of litigation related to loss and damage, um, all of this, to a large extent, makes us ask the question, who's lost, who's damage? And what is the maintenance cost? How does it function? So on this power chessboard, if we call it that, you have developed versus developing. You have China, you have G77, you have the small island states and the rest of the world. You have the annex countries and the non-annex countries. They're all striving to get ahead and they're all looking for ways and strategies not to lose. But most importantly, I'd say, power is resident in the capacity to produce emissions. Power is characterized by that very capacity how you produce, how you disseminate, how you regulate the drivers of fossil um, fuel extraction is all part of power. And power and powerlessness exist both, both internally and externally, and they, they, they often transcend political and geopolitical borders and boundaries with influential interest groups as well that are contending for greater influence. If you look at the current, um, the global economic arena, power is inherent and extended to the structures of an extractive economy because that's what we have. We have an extractive economy. And this is maintained by our constant appetite, our insatiable appetite for fossil fuel, for fossil fuel production, for fossil fuel dissemination, for fossil fuel expansion. The poorest ha half of the global population is responsible for only 10% of annual emissions, while the affluent 10 are responsible for 50%. And since the beginning of the industrial age, the majority of cumulative greenhouse gases have been produced by a small number of very prosperous countries. It's estimated that the highest 10% of earners in the U United States contribute more than six times the emissions of the bottom 50 with similar ratios observed in other nations. So we continue to observe substantial environmental degradation. And the nations, and, and, and environment de, and environmental degradations, and we, we see the nations that we can call culprits that are responsible for this. Those who have accumulated wealth as a result of their emissions can also use the wealth to protect themselves. So if I have the power to emit fossil fuel, I'm resting on that, on the, the associated power that comes with the resources of that fossil fuel to insulate myself from the risk that are related to fossil fuel. 
It's a very different story from countries who haven't got that head start, who haven't got those resources, who cannot use the monies that they have accumulated from fossil fuel production to buy themselves out, to bail themselves out, even with technologies. And so these dimensions of um, injustice are a large extent mediated by race. They're mediated by ethnicity. ethnicity. In fact, these are the conveyor belts of power. They're mediated by um, gender. Women bear a disproportionate share of the environmental de um, deterioration. And they have the greatest responsibility also of managing food security. So the largest emitters are typically the wealthiest and the most prosperous nations. But here's the irony. Um, this chart basically gives you a sense of um, productions of emissions um, versus the regions. And as you can see, Africa is way down, only 4% in terms of um, emissions productions. And if you look at North Africa, Europe, um, and even Asia, the fact that is, the fact still remains we're talking about China um, to a large extent, and we're talking about India. But these were not the stories of the, of the past. These are new emerging emitters. Um, and the irony here is that when you look at the sectors where we have the most carbon in terms of carbon intensive sectors, industry, um, land use, these are the very areas that countries in Africa need. Africa needs um, to produce steel, especially in terms of const construction. Africa needs industries. Um, many African governments have got this in their plans in terms of large-scale industrialization. But here's the thing, they cannot ind industrialize in the same way that Europe has done. Africa needs to industrialize differently because the resources that were there to service the industrialization of many European countries, those industries are no longer available. And even if they are, there is a big disinvestment away from coal, um, away from natural gas. And so this is where the problem lies. The problem lies in this inequity or, or inequitable situation or where countries that now want to take advantage of some of these um, sectors are not able to do it with the same means that other countries have enjoyed. And indeed, it's going to be very difficult to tell a country like Nigeria, where petroleum um, and petroleum products account for 90% of their export earning. How do you tell Nigeria that they have to leave these resources on the ground? Because it would almost literally kill their economy. And even for the most fearless leader, this can result into some kind of a political suicide. You can also not tell a country like Tanzania um, that has also found gas um, and is looking at how it could use um, over 57, I would say, quadrillion cubic feet of natural gas that's found in Tanzania to use this to actually bolster its economy. How do you tell a country like Tanzania um, that has hopes and anticipation of um, fixing this whole problem of energy security and energy poverty? How do you tell Tanzania that it cannot enjoy this resource, that the resource has to be buried and it has to be left in the ground. So the fact is that our consumption and our production patterns have resulted in a depleted carbon budget. And this is another indication of power. Um, I don't want to sound too alarmist, but the word is in terms of the science that we only have 23 years left in terms of the carbon budget. And there are countries in Africa that feel that they have to take advantage of their right to development. Um, and therefore, how do you then tell them that this is now not possible? The interesting thing about the current debate is that we have moved from a principle of polluter pays principle to we're all in this together. The common but differentiated responsibility has been diluted as well. And now we're talking about nationally determined contributions. 
So your capacity to adapt and to mitigate depends on what you say in your nationally um, determined contributions. So the governance, which to a large extent for me is the, the theater of power, is in itself quite flawed because it means that the solidarity that developing countries need and countries in Africa need um, to be able to have the tools that they need in place, that solidarity is very often missing. Uh, the funds that, we, 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 that I mentioned in terms of funds that could help adaptation and mitigation are very often not present. And then we have this labyrinth of the financial architecture. Even looking at this and trying to understand the who's who behind this, you know, is enough to give you a headache. <laughs> um, there are um, many players on this board. And it's also a, a very complex um, architecture. It's very fast paced. It's also almost messy. So understanding this and understand how you influence the market, how you move from your bilateral donors, how you move from donors that are very, um, I mean, um, institutions that are very much specific to the UNFCC process, um, how you take advantage of funds that are supposedly there to help, um, it's very difficult. It's difficult because it's almost like you need a passport, like a visa and you have to fulfill many requirements. And, and you would go to another funder and those requirements are doubled. So developing countries have a hard time to really understand what they need to do. The, the chessboard is sometimes likened to almost a space of hope and despair because the luxury of waiting is indicative of power. 2009 with Copenhagen, there was a sense that let's start a fast start finance. The idea was the fast start finance would, you know, move things a little bit faster. The next year it was, oh, let's, let's confirm the fast start finance. It was all about pledges and not real monies that are going into adaptation and mitigation. The next year it was, oh, we can still confirm the fast start. But let's also give ourselves a benchmark of about 30 million between 2010 and 2012. Meanwhile, what happens to the Sahelian farmer? What happens to people in the Horn of Africa that haven't got any more threshold to adapt? And in Paris, there was a lot that was done to help come to the Paris Agreement, arrive at that conclusion. And here there was, a, there, was, there was this expression about, let's note the progress we've made, but let's look at various sources and progression beyond previous efforts. So we want to go ahead, but we want progression beyond previous efforts. And further on as we go in all the different COPs, even as we ended with the um, Sharm El Sheikh COP, one can see that it's a case of noting, affirming, uh, progress has been made, semantics on words, and for it to land very often in pledges and not real action. And in the end, one can say that the monies are not adding up. And this has been the, the, the situation. 2014, 62 billion, then it went up. 2018, about 17 billion. In 2019, about 80 billion. And then 2020, we are about 80.3 80 billion. But we're still very much woefully short of the 100 billion that we have talked about. When you think about it in terms of Africa, Africa's finance gap is 1.3 to 1.6 trillion if they are able to implement the NDCs. It looks almost impossible with how the money is trickling down. Um, on top of this, we have to think about some of the other problems, which is the problem related to stranded assets, whereby there is no substitute. Yes, granted, and many of us have argued that it is in Africa's best interest to think about how it will manage and exit out of fossil fuel. But what is the substitute? What, what replaces the 70% of exports 
in terms of fiscal um, revenue that African countries earn, fossil fuel dependent countries earn, what will replace it? Um, that discussion is not being had. If you look at it from South Africa's perspective, um, 30, they export 30% of their coal. Um, I'm not even discussing here the number of job losses. 200,000 people will lose their jobs. And I want us to say that when we talk about just transition, let's not zoom in only on the jobs aspect. Just transition has implications for more than jobs. It's a macroeconomic problem because it means you'll have to look at your fiscal space. You have to think about other ways to substitute what you were earning before. You have to look at so many aspects of your macroeconomic policies. So people tend to zoom in on jobs, but it's more than jobs. It takes away the power of developing countries to be able to plan ahead. And therein lies the problem. If you look at Ghana, Ghana basically um, is, a, is a country that is reliant on oil and gas. And it is true, and we shouldn't forget this, it is true that the oil and gas industry has been very much of an enclave economy. And it is true that we see a lot of corruption. There is over $80 billion that leaves Africa on a yearly basis in terms of illicit financial flow. That is true. But nevertheless, the export earnings that Ghana gets, 400,000 students are given the opportunity to enter into high school. So the implications of justice is that, what do you replace that with? If countries are now to forfeit and to forego these resources, where, what do you replace it with? And the situation goes for Angola as well. Um, and we have to connect the export earnings with um, the balance of payments, or I should say imbalances of payment. The fact is that because these countries export, the monies they get are, are in foreign currency. They use some of these funds to service their debts. And that foreign currency is also very important. And so some of these phenomena are things that we do not seem to have the space where the powers that be, developed developing countries, are having this conversation in terms of, forget about the 100 billion a year. How do we ask a continent that is only producing 4% of emissions to give up this amount of monies, amount of jobs, especially, especially when in some of these very countries, they haven't been able to come full circle. They haven't solved the problem of energy poverty. They haven't solved the problem of food security. And they have tremendous difficulties um, in addressing issues around poverty. So how do you ask these countries? It's a matter of, I always use the metaphor of uh, a road traffic. If we're talking about an acceleration of um, the transition, who stays in the fast lane? And who stays in the slow lane? So we need to be able to look at these power dynamics and decide on how to, how to do that. And it continues. This was just a, a story about Zambia uh, when they had um, COVID. Um, basically, um, the, the, the situation of stranded asset, looking at the economic losses, um, losing potential 199 tons of finished copper annually. It's a huge amount. Potential job losses about 11,000 employees and 1.5 billion to take over um, in terms of assets that government would have to plow in to prevent some of these losses. The same goes for um, another um, pipeline in Zambia. The story continues. It's a story of loss, loss, loss. Um, and it's loss from a population perspective, community's perspective, loss in terms of governments and their plans, um, and government is not able to put in place the requisite support levers and tools. Um, in other words, how can they help their citizens? And if I would say this wasn't a paradox in itself, there is the situation of natural gas. Now the natural gas situation is very interesting 
because many African countries were excited about finding natural gas. And many African countries were basically saying that natural gas could be our exit strategy, but at the same time, we could use it to power our industries. The natural gas would be enough to help in the production of fertilizers. That we can use natural gas, also um, the gas, liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, for women who are very often um, victims, I'd say. They are casualties of indoor air pollution. And by the way, pollution kills about 1.1 million people in Africa every year. So many countries were excited. But the fact still remains that natural gas has been seen as not, not so clean. It has its problems. Um, leakages can occur, and therefore, there was a sense that many African countries were told that you have to forgo your natural gas resources. I think the interesting thing came um, during the um, Ukrainian war, um, the Russian-Ukrainian co um, um, conflict, when we saw a lot of double speak, where the very countries that were telling many countries in Africa to really put their natural gas and leave it in the ground, were the same countries that were now stockpiling on natural gas, identifying sources of natural gas. And the sense was that this would be essential to keep homes in Germany, homes in the Netherlands, warm. <laughs> So, so this, is the, this is the irony. The irony is that even when resources are essential as a way out for some of these countries, the narrative on that is that this is bad for you. You have an opportunity. Use your renewable energies. You have it in abundance. But at the same time, these very same countries are identifying places where they can still tap into that natural gas for the benefit of their citizenry. And the interesting thing is that the countries in Africa that are selling this natural gas to countries in Europe, their populations are not going to be enjoying natural gas. They will be caught off because many of the countries in Africa are not doing what they need to do in terms of providing energy for all. That is still a problem. So herein lies um, the, 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 the irony in terms of natural gas. And I think it's also important to say that... Um, one of, one of the other arguments, and this is what I meant by the power of the narrative, and it's an important one. One of the arguments that is used to dissuade African countries from procuring and investing in natural gas is to say that look at the technology that you need. Look at how complicated this is. Um, to put in this infrastructure, it will take you 30 years, and it is true. It will take 30 years. And so the logic is that does Africa need to start investing in upstream gas production, in processing, liquefaction, shipping, regasification, downstream combustion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do they need to do that for 30 years and even more? So here are some of the, the issues that are related. To, and and, and I, I wanted to say that any way you look at this, whether you're thinking about it from a restorative justice perspective, distributive justice, or even procedural justice, the situation is flawed with injustices. And we talked to a number of policymakers across Africa, and this is something one of the policymakers in Namibia said. It is totally unfair and illogical that we cannot make use of our own resources to advance our economies, while our natural gas, our natural resources previously advanced the Western world and still are. So these are some of the difficulties. I wanted to, as I'm coming to an end, to really talk very quickly about the, the situation. Because there is excitement. Um, there is excitement in the sense that um, Namibia, um, because of the fact that they have now gotten hydrogen, and they have hydrogen in huge reserves, that the Namibian situation could be a cause for hope. But is it a cause for hope? Um, the implications of power and inequity continues because Namibia has just recently signed a 10 billion green hydrogen investment with a, a German company called Hyphen. And um, basically this would last over a period of 40 years. 
hyphen will govern the development, the implementation, and the operation of this. And this would also include building factories, pipelines, ports, with the goal of producing up to about 2 billion tons of ammonia by 2030. Now, hyphen will pay land tax because you need land. They will pay royalties, 5% royalties, and they will also pay income tax to the Namibian government. However, higher earnings can be derived from owning a share of the project. So it'd be interesting to see who owns the shares. The government of Namibia will have the opportunity to invest up to 24% of equity stake. This is about 2.4 billion into the project. And this is a project that is estimated to be about 10 billion. It's important now to ensure that the government earns a significant stake in the project and in the revenues and can profit from it so that they can benefit their country. But so far, the country, the government has only been able to raise about 540 million euros and a, a concessional funding through the partnership with the European Union. So there is a shortfall in all of 1.8 billion that is remaining. And if the government is not able to raise this, what happens? To a large extent, it means that a good part of this investment will not be Namibian owned. Um, there would be a lot of borrowing. Many countries in Africa are already saddled with debt. The technologies that they need to buy themselves out to be able to procure mitigation technologies or um, put themselves up, I would say, ahead of the curve, those technologies are not there. They will have to go back to the same borrowers. And this is where the problem lies. The problem lies that here is a technology, here is a resource that everyone is excited about. But when you do the arithmetic, you realize that a good part of the monies will not stay in Namibia. And that also is an issue of, um, of injustice. I'm coming to the end of my talk, happily. <laughs> Just to say that I wanted to give this last example related to um, the European Green Deal. And I think many of us are excited about the European Green Deal. We even see the Green Deal as a catalyst for Africa to have its own Green Deal. Um, it's an ambitious project, but there are certain aspects of it um, that means that the mitigation of the EU, which is to be commended, is now to some extent transposed and transferred to some countries in Africa. Um, there is obviously the example of um, Mozambique, because the idea of the, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is to basically say that the European Union is shutting trade to countries where, um, that may be exporting goods where the carbon intensity of those good, goods are quite high. And it does make sense. But in this case, it has a negative impact on a country like Mozambique that would lose about 1% of its GDP um, due to the fact that this is coming from aluminium that it's exporting, and that would come from a carbon-intensive sector. But the question then remains, should Mozambique be paying for that loss? Or shouldn't the EU find some kind of a buffer whereby um, they, Mozambique can cushion itself a along that line and would not be affected? Um, there are several issues to talk about. I just want to talk about the, the aspect of debt, which I talked about, but the, there's this aspect of sovereign risk. Many countries are now defaulting in Africa on their debt. We've seen the case with Zambia. We've seen Ghana defaulted on its euro bond. So as long as we're not talking about these issues around, around an issue of political economy, as long as we're not talking about it around debt, it would take a long time for the problem to address because these are also the very powerful forces in the room. And the whole aspect of cleaning up is important, but who should clean up? Where should it start? The fact still remains that there are big needs in Africa. And in as much as the continent is only producing 4%, it's important that their priority is right, 
that they get their priority right. And getting that priority right means that Africa cannot default on the production of energy or providing energy security to all, or even agriculture. The continent is basically spending over $100 billion a year on food imports. And this is a continent that we tend to say has got 60% of the world's arable land. So there's a, there's a mismatch here. Something is not quite aligned. So we need to make sure that whatever Africa does, it does it, but at the same time does not delegitimize growth and does not leave aside many of its own people that are already suffering from chronic poverty. So how do we reclaim this? I want to go back to the theme of power. How do we reclaim this? Um, Martin Heyer had a very interesting um, conference where we were talking about future pathways. And in that conference, I think I was now forced to think about what happens, what happens in 60 years' time. And it's interesting to say that Africa is already ahead because it's got an Agenda 2063, which is a lot more ambitious than the Agenda 2030 that we've, we've all espoused to and, and acknowledged. But I want to also say how we get it right goes back to understanding the things that are a priority for African countries. And the Great Green Wall is an ambitious program that is meant to support African countries because this is about planting of trees, but it's also about creating this very long corridor in the Sahel that would help in terms of desertification, climate change, also even in terms of jobs. But some of these projects that are dear to Africa are not being funded or not supported quite to the tune that they need to be. So I think that there is hope, but it means that we have to look at how countries, um, um, developed countries are supporting this kind of indigenous-based project, local projects. Then there's the, the informal sector. One of the things that I'm consistently saying is that there can be no adaptation, no mitigation, if we do not take along with us the informal sector. 83% of employment is coming from the informal sector. They are a force for good. Yes, perhaps their formal ways is are hidden because they, the taxes and regulations are not adhered to, but we cannot think about a radical movement of decarbonizing our systems if we do not bring the informal sector to the fore. So this is very important. Deliberative democracy. We need to talk to people. This is about people. The preposition matters. It's for people. It's about people. And we cannot talk to ourselves in big conferences like the Conference of Parties without talking to people. And this scenario was something that happened in DRC. And it was about how you reforest the riverbanks and you create some kind of a green belt. And there were lots of benefits. They were able to use the trees as buffer. They were able to cover, um, uh, um, cover themselves from the, or insulate themselves from ferocious winds. They were able to have carbon sequestration benefits. People matter. Uh, that plurality of voices, which for me is an ambition, is what I would want to do with the Prince Klaus Chair, to see how do we transform these spaces that are elite space, that suffer from elite capture, where we talk about democratization or we talk about um, just transition in a very niche way. How do we open up the spaces so that we can hear plurality of voices? We can hear what others have to say about just transition. How do we do that? And we do, we do it not just with science. Science is not enough. Culture is a very important part of it. And I, I would say that the power of culture is as important as the power of science. Because culture is about spaces and people. And if we apply science and we don't take into, con into account the context and the culture in which people live, we don't count indigenous knowledge. It's not important. But indigenous knowledge have been used hundreds of years. They should be our foundational point. So we have to think about how do we use them as banks and these banks are hollowing out. In indigenous knowledge is using, losing its potency. So this is about how we raise the voices and how we raise the voices to allow for space, how we take advantage of all these resources that I mentioned, the green minerals, um, which I think is an, imp it's an important part um, 
of the, the, hope, the hopeful story that I mentioned. Um, and we cannot ignore that. We cannot ignore the fact that as we are thinking about this, and there seems to be another scramble for Africa, we need to be able to start thinking about how do we do this in an orderly fashion? How do we do this without reproducing the similar inequities and injustices that we've seen with some of the other fossil fuels? And the beauty is we are also saying that this is the continent that has the resources that the world needs, has the cobalt, right? Lithium ion batteries. People are thinking about producing electric vehicles. They're all resident in the continent. But how do we do it with people of the continent and how do we do it in a way that doesn't exacerbate some of the problems that we've talked about? Um, this has been a long lecture, so let me end. <laughs> I want to end with this, um, a quote from, um, 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 I can't remember now, <laughs> but it says that our challenge is to use the fierce urgency of the present to drive a deep institutional turn into economic ordering towards equality, democracy and environmental justice. It is time we own the future. Thank you.